Hello everyone. Hola, ciao, gruetzi, willkommen, bonjour. My name is Simon Fox. I am a developer and designer, and I am a digital nomad. Today I'm going to talk to you about travel, work, and WordPress. I'm going to cover why and how, and also take a look at some tips and techniques that we can use working with and around WordPress to enable a digital nomad lifestyle. As a digital nomad, I have worked in all of these locations. I started my career in the tech sector in the early 90s, worked in infrastructure for 17 years as an IT manager and a solution architect, but it wasn't making me happy, so I changed gears, quit, started my own company focusing on my passions of development and design. That was 11 years ago. I've been building WordPress sites ever since. WordPress makes up 80% of my income and has enabled me to travel the world whilst developing. What is a digital nomad? It is someone who can and does travel whilst working. Just a thought exercise to start things off. Don't worry, um, introverts, I'm not going to ask you to vocalize or put up your hands. But in your own mind, I want you to think about your bucket list, the places that you always wanted to go to, or maybe a place that you'd like to go back to. I want you to pick one place and focus on that. And picture yourself there, not just as a tourist, but working there for a week or a month or a little bit longer. As we talk through today, I want you to keep focusing on that place and picture yourself there. I'm going to start with the why question because it's important to frame things. Sometimes we can live a little too close to our screens. There's a lot of really good quotes out there of the benefits of travel. For me as a WordPress developer, the biggest benefit has been the people that you get to talk to. It expands your network to a global reach of friends, colleagues, and clients. And I think it's important to talk to people not just in our field, but out of our field. Talking to non-WordPress developers has made me a much better WordPress developer, and the same thing applies with design. Talking to architects, musicians, baristas, doctors, all of these people have a unique perspective that we can take on board if we have an open mind, take crea um, creativity, inspiration, become better people, and do better work. Never before in human history has there been an opportunity quite like this for so many people, and we are the beneficiaries of this. We work online, and that means we technically can work anywhere. We have a freedom that other career paths often don't have, and WordPress is a huge part of that. My parents traveled in their 20s, like a lot of people in that generation. Australians love to travel. They went over to North America, lived in Canada for a while, traveled around Europe as well. And it's interesting to reflect on the cost of travel, which hasn't changed all that much. When they came back to Sydney, probably because I put a baby-sized dent in their travel plans, they bought a house. That is something that has changed a little bit. And to put that into perspective, we need to add in the salaries so that we can take a look at the relative cost and we can see that we have an opportunity when it comes to travel that other generations haven't had. At the same time as economies have been changing, the internet has been changing. It's been getting faster and more prevalent. It's interesting to see that Australia is beating Kazakhstan and Guam. <laughs> I'm not going to talk about the MBN today because nobody likes an angry presenter, but... <laughs> If you can work in Australia today, the point is you can work elsewhere. I've had faster internet in Cambodia, Peru, Serbia, and many other places than I often get in Australia. A lot of people I talk to are jealous of this opportunity that we have. Life's short. Let's make use of it. So that's the why. That's the lens through which I want to take a look at the how and some of the tips and techniques. I think it's important to ease into a digital nomad lifestyle. I started with two and four week trips, which are pretty common for most people. Then six week trips, four month trips, consecutive round the world trips, that was working pretty well. Come back to Sydney, reload, reset, talk to your clients, talk to your family and friends, get a little bit more work going. And eventually people get used to the fact that you are consistent and reliable whilst you are remote and longer becomes possible. Conferences are a really good way to anchor such trips because conferences, I mean, they're fantastic for networking, but they're also tax deductible and they make a portion of your trip tax deductible. So contact an accountant or, an AT or the ATO for that, for some more details. 
The one city that you've got in your mind, are you still thinking of that? For me, that's Florence in Italy. Imagine you land there and you have a week to enjoy that place and a huge project lands just as you arrive. Have you allowed enough time to be able to meet your commitments and actually enjoy the place that you're in? So it's important to think about that when we're planning our travel as digital nomads. For me, that ended up being three to four weeks per location, ideally, minimizing that travel between location and scheduling certain blocks of work like maintenance, for example, in your calendar. For example, first or third weekend of every uh, month. Traveling solo is fantastic. You go out there and you tackle the world on your own terms. Can be a bit of a double-edged sword. The flexibility is where this really becomes a strength. It is a little bit lonely and that's why it's character building. <laughs> but uh, you can chop and change the way that you travel, change your locations every couple of days if the work gets a little bit light. Ideally, if you're doing this, you're only booking your travel a couple of days to a week in advance so that when the big projects do land, you can set yourself down in a nice place and actually do that. What's interesting is in the last four or five years, there's been an increase in the number of companies that target and serve as digital nomads. These are companies like Remote Year, Unsettled, Nomad Cruise. There's a lot of workspaces, for example, in Ubud and Bali that will also provide packages, including accommodation. These companies take a lot of the problems uh, and time cost out of organizing your travel. Let's take a look at one of those. Remote Year. The reason I've chosen this company, I'm not sponsored by anyone today, by the way. If I mention a company or a product, it's just enthusiasm or experience. Remote Year is the program that I did last year in 2017. It is a company that organizes your travel for you and you travel in a group. There's a group that leaves every month. You live in a different city every month with like-minded people. I started in Kuala Lumpur in February, did four months in Southeast Asia, four months in Europe, four months in South America. It's a fantastic program. The people that come out of that are like family. These are lifelong friendships and partnerships that open a world of opportunity for us. And they're not just developers and designers. That made up about 40 to 50% of the people that were in my group. But you get some really interesting people that you get to travel and collaborate with. I had uh, in my group a, a nurse who was studying for her master's degree and doing that remote. There were uh, people in accounting, property management. There was a guy who sold a vaping business in Florida. He was looking for his next opportunity. So it's absolutely fantastic. It's also very interesting to note that more than 50% of people that do these programs have full-time employment. That might be surprising to a lot of people. What does a program like that cost? Again, I'm not sponsored. There's a lot of the competition is very similar in pricing. About 2,000 bucks US per month. It's actually 27,000 for the whole year when you add in the deposit, which when I sat down and did the calculations was within a margin of error of the total cost of living in Sydney. So it is affordable as well. So that's the why and the how. Let's start taking a look at how we can start to pay for that and we'll get into some WordPress details as well. If you are a full-time employee, it is worth your time to talk to your employer. You may be surprised at how many of them are open-minded when it comes to remote work. Highlight the benefits. You're not gonna take up much space in their office. That might be a benefit to them. Uh, you may not be taking up valuable bandwidth that other people in the office can use to be more productive. They can attract global talent that they may not be able to attract locally. And they are perceived as a forward-thinking company. Plus, they retain a valuable asset, and that's you. You can prove that it works if they're still on the fence by working from home. Ease them into it as well. And if they're still not up for helping you out with your desires to go remote traveling, there's a lot of companies that advertise those sorts of jobs and support it. If you're a freelancer, I sincerely hope you do already know how to win business. That's the ideal way of doing it. I'm not going to tell you how to run your business, but time is an interesting way that we can take a look at things because that's common across all of our businesses. Time is something that is important because if we can work twice as fast, we can do twice as much work or spend some of that time enjoying the places that we're in. So efficiencies. When we're building themes, building themes is a huge topic. I could talk for days on this stuff, 
but I just want to cover a couple of different points. A lot of us, when we build sites, we use frameworks. These are things like Divi, Genesis, et cetera, et cetera. Some of us buy themes on marketplaces like ThemeForest and we'll use those. Absolutely fantastic. I highly recommend that uh, as developers and designers, if we're working with these, we try as many of them as possible. I'll buy all of them, regardless of whether or not I have a project that uses it, because I think it's important to see how different theme frameworks work, how they think, uh, because all of us solve problems differently, whether we're a de developer, a designer, or a content manager. We all approach our work differently. What we're looking for is the path of least resistance here, the approach that most closely aligns to the way that we think and the way that we want to work. Because the ultimate goal after going broad is to narrow down, find the one that actually closely aligns to us and get really master it, because familiar equals fast. Please, if we do use frameworks, and a lot of us do, this is, I hope that this is a point that no one is going to be surprised about. Please use child themes. I'm still finding clients out there that come to me and say, please fix my WordPress site. And it's a, a site that's been built by someone else, and they put the changes actually in the parent theme and not used a child theme. And that locks us out of updates. That is a security risk to our clients. Please use child themes. If that's a scary concept, and I understand that it might be, maybe we don't want updates applying to our themes being controlled by a third party. Starter themes are another way that we can look for efficiencies to buy time. These are theme frameworks that don't have updates built in, but they give us a rolling start for our development, and they can help with speed. Ultimately, you may reach a point like I did where you decide to build your own, and you may decide to leverage a starter theme framework, get, you know, kickstart your own framework, and take inspiration from some of the other frameworks that are out there. The end goal here, ultimately, though, is speed. We still need to do our research and go broad to make sure that we are going down the right path. Consistency when we develop. We roll out our sites and we give those to our customers and they log on to the back end, they edit their content, and ideally, if we've done a really good job, we get repeat business. We do multiple sites for these clients, sometimes over a decade or more. I think it's important that when they access these sites, they have consistency in the user experience. That reduces support calls, makes us faster when we provide the support, and it makes them com comfortable and confident when they edit their content. And familiar equals fast does not just apply to us, that also applies to our clients. If we do incremental improvements over, say, for example, a decade of development with one particular client, consider rolling those incremental improvements back to the other sites that are already live. Plugins. Get two or more WordPress people in a room, and eventually the conversation's going to come down to, hey, uh, uh, what plugins do you use? It's, it, we've all done it. It's worth talking about this, this feature because sometimes it's overlooked, and it's worth reinforcing if you do know it. If you go to WordPress.org, sign in with your username, and browse the plugin repository, you can favorite a plugin, and that stores to your user profile as your part of your curated list. Then when you are installing WordPress or managing any WordPress installation, you can put, go to uh, plugins, add plugin, go to favorites, put in your username, and see your curated list, activate and install from there. That's public. You can give out your username to other people, but please, if we're giving out usernames, make sure we use a password management system and we have unique, secure passwords everywhere. WPFAVS is another alternative for lists and bulk plugin installation, but that does require a plugin of its own to, to do that. When we're coding for the developers, local development is a fantastic thing that we should always look at when we're traveling. WAMP, ZAMP, MAMP, no, I don't have a stroke. Those are the acronyms. And the guys from Flywheel uh, with their local tool, there's plenty of others out there. We need to take a look at those and plan for the times where we may not have connectivity. A flight from Sydney to Dallas is 20 hours. I've built a site on that flight. Last year in November, I was on a Russian icebreaker from Ushuaia in Argentina to Antarctica, built a site on there. Local dev, that's how we do it. Portable apps. 
I love portable apps. These are apps that you don't actually install so much as extract to a file system. You can run them from a USB key, move them around. I like to run them from within Cloud Sync, like Dropbox, sync between all your devices. And that way, if you lose your laptop or there is equipment failure, your development suite is back up and running instantly. CSS compilers, any developers in here that, well, we should all be aware of CSS compilers. These are languages like SAS and LESS, which is basically CSS with variables, programming logic, functions, et cetera. You can take a color and darken it by a certain percentage. Traditionally, use alongside local development because you need to compile them into CSS, but they speed up our development enormously. We should all be taking a look at using those. And there are tools like Prepros, Grunt, Gulp, that can help automate the way that we do the compilation. They will watch our projects for changes in the files, and they will auto-compile. I like to pair that, for example, with Sublime Text, which has a nice extension that will save when the program loses focus. Tap and away in your SAS file, alt tab to the browser, Sublime Text auto saves, Prepros auto compiles, and you're looking at your changes in a minified CSS. What's interesting about CSS compilers is I'm starting to see these in themes, either as part of their source files to help you uh, make modifications, or as actual PHP compilers built into theme frameworks. And that's really interesting when you Couple that with, for example, the WordPress Customizer API. You can expose options to your clients using the Customizer, and when they publish the Customizer options, you can write that out to a SAS variable file, trigger a compile, and again, you're spitting out a single minified CSS for your clients. That's a nice, exciting option. Again, all of these are just looking at ways that we can build efficiencies into the way that we do our work so that we can actually enjoy the Pasteca Fiorentina when we're in Florence. This is a personal one. Not everyone's going to agree with me on this one, I expect. WordPress by default installs in the root directory. I like to install it in the subdirectory, always. I find it to be neater. Yes, that's a slight OCD thing. But it enables me to have files in the root directory, for example, holding pages, Google verification things that aren't actually stored and backed up with the WordPress installation. You can have multiple instances of WordPress in the hosting, same hosting environment, dev site and old backup site, and it's very neat when you actually work with that. And when you use backup systems like Backup Buddy and you're backup, doing your backup inside a WordPress instance, you don't need to remember to add exclusion directories to your backup system. You're just getting that instance. That's been a nice efficiency gain for me over the years. Tiny MCE Advanced is a fantastic plugin in the repository that enables you to customize the toolbars in your editor. I like to do that to provide a consistent and customized UI to all my clients, and you can export the settings. Export those settings, store them in a library, similar to how designers have a design pattern library. Do that with any plugin that allows you to export those settings so that you can reduce your repetitive tasks, provide a faster build time and consistency across all of our sites. Same thing can apply to page builders that allow you to export things. Always be looking for those efficiency gains with everything that we do. We can sync those via Dropbox, for example. Great when you're working with the team for that consistency across multiple people. Another way that we can take a look at helping to fund things is with multiple income streams. We'll take a look at a couple of those options. Every site needs hosting. I used to go to my clients and say, give me the hosting. Uh, you, get, you organize the hosting. It's your relationship. You just give me the username and password, and I'll take care of the rest. What would happen is that they would go out and get the cheapest, nastiest hosting possible. Often that was in the United States, even though their entire client base and focus was Australia. Caused nothing but problems for them and for me. So this is an opportunity for us. You don't need to know anything about hosting or about Linux, et cetera. There are plenty of uh, companies out there that provide reseller hosting. All you need to do is create the account. That's a fantastic way of speeding up the way that we build our sites. From start to finish, we can be the domain registrar as well, register the domain, set up the account, have WordPress auto come into the file system via a cPanel skeleton directory, which is just a template directory, auto come in, and we're up and running in five minutes or less, ready to do our content editing or building. 
It also enables us to choose the hosting company with the best reputation, the best support. And that's really important when we travel. You don't want to be on the phone for an hour waiting for someone because the hosting company has decided to do their upgrades at a bad time. That's another bad problem with hosting in the United States, by the way. They do all their updates out of hours, which is our business hours. So if you're targeting Australian customers, please use Australian hosting. And if you have clients that do not pay their invoices, they drag their feet, you can suspend the accounts because you control it. We have a vested interest in our sites continuing to function. Our responsibility does not end when a site goes live. Case in point, I built a site for a very large, prominent Australian company many years ago in the 3.x days, well before WordPress was doing their auto updates, etc. Site went live, the client was very happy, but they didn't want to make any changes. Zero changes were made for three years, and they didn't want us to make any changes either. So it just sat there. Every now and then I'd check on it, and one day I came back and had a look, and there was an awful lot of Arabic on the screen, and a guy with an AK-47. So what's the first thing you do when you see that? You call the client and make sure they haven't changed their branding. <laughs> they had not. I reverted from backup. I found the vulnerability in WordPress core in the file editor, and I tracked the threat back to a hacking school in Syria. WordPress is open source, which is fantastic. It's free. We get to the benefit of that. But we're not the only ones taking a look at the source code. Hackers are doing this as well and looking for vulnerabilities. There are websites that track the vulnerabilities, make it very easy for them. So we need to do WordPress maintenance. I believe that is our responsibility, and it is also an opportunity. This should be a line item with all of our clients. It should be part of the conversation from day one. It should be hosting, domain registration, site build, maintenance. Completely separate line items in our invoicing. We should be providing backup within WordPress storing those backups off-site securely. We should be testing those backups, making sure that we can restore and migrate very easily. Update responsibly. What do I mean by that? Read the change logs. Read the change logs on every plugin update. There are a lot of companies out there that provide managed WordPress hosting, and they will update the plugins for you. I guarantee you this. They are not reading the change logs on the plugins and saying, I built the site. I know that's fine. They may roll things back, they may do some nice things, but we are the ones that have the ability to manage this a lot better, and that is an opportunity for us to have another income stream and a relationship with the client that continues. We can value add to the maintenance product by buying premium plugins and including that in the cost. We need to look for opportunities to buy developer licenses that can be installed on unlimited sites, lifetime licenses wherever possible, and include those. It's nothing worse than a site having plugins that are way out of date and causing major problems because the, the client has forgotten to update their credit card details on the 13 to 20 different plugin sites that we've got. And we can include some nominal time for fixing certain things. Sometimes a widget may, uh, author may change the class names from underscores to dashes and all of your styles break. Include a little bit of time to actually fix these things in the WordPress maintenance contract. We can speed up the way that we do this WordPress maintenance with bulk tools. Infinite WP, Manage WP, iTheme Sync, they're all good tools. They allow us to see all of our sites that we manage from a single dashboard and push out changes. Take a look at a plugin. The only thing that's in the change log is Romanian translation. Bam, push it out to every site with a single click. And record that change in the database so that we can do client reporting and prove to our clients what the value is of this WordPress maintenance contract. They're also very nice because they actually plug into the websites that track vulnerabilities and they can highlight them to us. So even though we may be doing uh, WordPress maintenance at a certain schedule, whether that's weekly, monthly, et cetera, we should be checking dashboards like this regularly to look for zero day vulnerabilities and patching those immediately. This is a screenshot of the upcoming Infinite WP 3.x release that I'm looking forward to, clearly showing plugins, themes, WordPress core, and translations that you can push out en masse. It also shows you what versions are coming up, uh, need to be updated, and you can click on those to actually get hot links straight into the change logs. All of these things speed up the way that we do our maintenance, 
allowing us to enjoy the places that we are in as we travel. Plan for the worst, hope for the best. A little bit of paranoia is healthy, I think. What's the worst that can happen? Probably what happened to me in December <laughs> in Santiago. I was having dinner and drinks with a very good friend and a little bit distracted and everything was gone. Laptop, mobile phone, wallet with cash and cards, passport, mouse mat. <laughs> I really miss that mouse mat. I've got nothing. So we need to have some paranoia. I was back up and running within five minutes. I use a password management system. There's a lot of good ones out there. I like LastPass. They've got an emergency access feature. So if I get hit by a bus, I can have someone I trust gain access to my password vault. My clients are not at risk. You can also share password vaults amongst your team. Encrypt our drives when we have laptops. We must encrypt all of our drives, not just our laptops, our mobile phones. Make sure that's happening and enable two-factor authentication on every system that supports it. And we also need to remember that there is a big difference between cloud backup and cloud sync. Cloud sync is things like Dropbox, Google Drive. These are not dedicated backup systems and we should not rely upon them in that function. An example of a backup, prop, like a proper backup program for Windows might be Backblaze, for example. So, today we've talked about the opportunity that we have as WordPress people to travel the world. We've taken a look at a couple of ways that that might actually be implemented for us and then take a look at some WordPress details and ways that we can structure the way that we build working with and around WordPress to buy time, <laughs> increase our income and see the world. I hope you've been inspired. I hope this means that you're gonna go out there. And if you do go out there, where will you go? Where was that place that you thought of at the start of the presentation? How realistic is this going to be for you in the near future? I hope it's realistic. And where will you send your next postcards from? Thank you very much. All right, time for questions. Anyone have any questions? <coughs> This is a bit of a parallel question, just because I was sticky peeking at some of your plugins that you had installed, mm. and I noticed you had ACF and Gutenberg, mm -hmm. and I was just yeah, just wondering how that was going for the transition, because you must be getting ready for that. So you're a man on the ground, so it's probably important to keep all your clients happy. Uh, look, I, I I think Gutenberg is going to be a really interesting development. There's going to be some pain. There's going to be an adjustment period. People don't like change, but I think that this is a positive step. It will end up being a positive step for us. Um, it will change the way some of us will need to work. Uh, I use ACF Pro extensively in all of my sites uh, and did a little bit of testing not so recently ago and yeah, some things didn't work. But it is still uh, undergoing development and I will keep evaluating as that goes on. That may, the Gutenberg uh, ex way of editing may completely change the way that I build my sites and the way that I work on my own framework. I think everyone, as I said, everyone thinks differently. Everyone solves our problems differently. We need to evaluate what options are out there and see how the dust settles with a lot of these themes that we use. Maybe you're familiar with Divi really well. Take a look at how that works with their page builder uh, in conjunction with Gutenberg. I think a lot of this stuff is gonna work in conjunction. And there is a plugin, the classic editor plugin that we can activate to turn off Gutenberg, even in WordPress 5, that's my understanding anyway, uh, and keep working the way that we currently are while bugs are fixed and plugin vendors get up to speed. Hi, I'm just curious whether, did you get your laptop and things replaced under insurance? Do you have particular? I had insurance. Um, doing an insurance claim is painful. <laughs> uh, the, the insurance claim is probably as painful as the loss itself. Um, it is still undergoing. Uh, you need to provide a lot of receipts and proof of purchase and all that sort of thing. And getting all of that whilst you're traveling. I've only been back six or seven weeks um, after four years traveling. So 
Uh, I'm still in the process of getting all those receipts out of archive and out of storage and, and processing that insurance claim. But absolutely, we do need to take a look at our insurance when we travel. Um, it is highly recommended, not just for the theft side of things, but for our own health, especially if we're going to the United States. Question at the back. Oh, we've got one that's down here. Right. Uh, what are the tax implications of being outside of Australia for a year? And oh, good question. You know, I actually also, removed a slide about tax because I was concerned about time. Okay. Um, look, uh, when you travel, if you travel for business, uh, there are things that... I'm not a tax accountant, by the way. So please, uh, it is worth your while if you don't have a tax accountant to get one and to talk to them regularly. The tax laws change, not as often as web development, but they do change. It's absolutely worth talking to them. Uh, an example would be, um, you know, I, I was doing round the world trips, solo planned, anchoring in conferences, and I talked to my tax accountant. I said, how do I manage things? He talked me through the process of uh, recording that in a travel diary so that you can calculate what percentage of the trip, and what portions of things you can claim. When I started doing the remote year program, which is 12 months and it's an entrepreneur program. I went and had a chat to him. I said, this is gonna be a lot of travel. That's a lot that I gotta record in the travel diary. Do I really need to have that? So he went to the ATO and he said, please give us a private ruling on this one item for this one guy for a fixed period of time. And they came back with a very generous deduction that quite frankly surprised me. I'm not gonna tell you what it is, but it is absolutely worth your while to have that conversation regularly with your tax accountant. So the implication for your residency status, though, I mean... You, oh. I mean, obviously, you're still an Australian, but... No, I, I, I'm an Australian. I run an Australian business. I have clients all around the world, and I invoice from Australia. Um, that money comes into an Australian bank account, and I pay Australian tax. Uh, there's no problems with residency or anything like that. There's no difference to you, uh, you know, going to a conference and working out of that conference for a week. You're still Australian. You're just elsewhere. Yeah. Are you doing any of your work then for clients overseas when you're there? So if you're in Ireland or something, for instance, are you actually getting clients while you're there or are you still basically focusing on just your Australian clients and you're just servicing them remotely? And do you get involved in things like the meetups and things like that in the places that you're going so that you're really kind of getting immersed into the business of the local area? Good question. Uh, as I travelled uh, when I was doing my solo travel, meetup groups were fantastic ways of getting out and socialising when... You're in a country and you, you, you know, you're out there seeing the sights and you're doing your work, but you, you need that kind of social glue. Um, so they're fantastic. Uh, the meetup groups didn't lead to a lot of business gain, but it was fantastic just to make those connections and some of those connections I still have today. Um, when I was on the remote year program, there was no need to do meetup groups because I had a family of 70 people from all around the world, not just North America, New Zealand, uh, you know, UK, Australia, but Mongolia, Ukraine, fr France, Germany, Denmark, and all of these people were like a little bubble with us as we traveled, uh, made you feel very safe, and you were always, um, had someone to, to talk to and collaborate with. As for the client side of things, that can be a little bit sporadic. It's surprising how much work you can make uh, in terms of clients while you are traveling, but often that can be stuff that um, takes some time to develop. Sometimes that's a connection that you make, a conversation that you have. You have a coffee with someone, and then a year or two later, out of nowhere, you get a, a work contract. Um, I had been traveling with the Remote Year program. I was in, living in Portugal for the month. It was in July last year, and uh, a client called me up in Washington, D.C., and they said, hey, we're, we've got your name from X and Y. We'd like to talk to you about this project, and this is the scope. Do you think this is going to work? I said, no, your whole thing's going to come crashing down. Uh, that could be a disaster. So they flew me to D.C. and paid for me to live there for seven weeks, helping them do consulting. Um, these things sometimes can be a surprise <laughs> when you're out there and traveling. It's important to have an open mind, talk to people, make those connections, and don't be afraid if the work doesn't immediately land. Keep being open-minded, keep being open with your relationships as you travel. Um, as a digital nomad, do you use VAs and would you recommend using VAs? VAs? Like virtual assistants, so overseas. Uh, 
I don't like, like for example, four hour work week. Yeah. Have you read that? No. Okay, so four hour work week's basically about pretty much optimizing your entire life using VAs. Right. So yeah, optimizing efficiencies and stuff like that in business. Look, I personally don't, but I don't see why that wouldn't work. It all depends on what kind of person you are and how comfortable you are with delegating certain tasks. Uh, for me, I'm able to, I run my, my business. I am, I am a developer, I am a designer. I can do all of that work. I know my account system, which is accessible online. I use zero. I can do my bad statements while remotely. I can do my personal income tax because my accountant can get in there remotely. Uh, so there's not a lot of tasks that I would actually need a VA for, especially when I'm doing a program like Remote Year and they organize all of your travel, all of your accommodation, workspace, et cetera, meet you at the airport. They're like, here's your welcome kit. Here's your SIM card with your data for the month. Here's the welcome pack. These are the languages, that, you know, common phrases you might need and good restaurants and stuff like that. So I didn't need a VA. Yeah, but thanks, you're giving me an idea. <clears throat> Very good, Simon. How do you <laughs> deal with time zones and clients all around the world and you being all around the world and disciplining yourself not to go exploring through the rainforest because it's a beautiful day and just staying in your hotel or wherever you are? Um, yeah. Yeah, oh, good question. Um, much like being a freelancer and working from home, there is an element of discipline that we must have in order to meet our commitments regularly. That doesn't change when you travel. It gets a little bit more difficult because there's so many cool things out there to do. Um, yeah, um, I find that the time zone stuff is manageable when I'm a freelancer because I can schedule those calls with the client, get on there, go through the brief, work through any change requests that might happen to do, and the client is happy. At that point, they get off the call. I can schedule the work whenever I need to do the work. It doesn't need to happen in their time zone. I only need to communicate in their time zone. So it's not that bad. For the people that travel with me who are full-time employees, though, that was a little bit more tricky. For example, the people who were um, in, from North America, especially on the East Coast, when we were living in Kuala Lumpur, and Southeast Asia for four months, we basically called them the Night's Watch. And you often wouldn't see them. They'd wake up, come for breakfast as we went for dinner, we'd socialize, and they would go do a night's work as we went to bed or partied. So that was a little bit difficult for them for four months, but they got their revenge when we got to South America. <laughs> so, you know, I think it's manageable. And there's a lot of good tools out there for helping you manage that time zone stuff. Yeah. I think we have four minutes left for questions, if anyone else has one for Simon. Any softballs? Yeah. Well, um, I've got a question. Um, so, so when your bag was stolen, yes. how quickly did it take you to get set up with another laptop? Do you carry two, two, two laptops with you? I mean... I don't. So what, you had to go and buy a new one? Uh, that was normally, yes, you would need to. Uh, I was lucky in that uh, I was still on this remote year program. I was in Santiago. We were uh, in our 11th month, and we all knew each other very well. So I had a team of people around me who were able to provide support, uh, people who were able to give me a loan, a laptop, the workspaces that we used that were 24-hour, seven-day week, biometrically controlled workspaces, often had a spare computer that you could use. And because a lot of my data and my environment is uh, cloud-synced and backed up, uh, I had no problems restoring and getting everything back up and running almost immediately. Um, I still miss that laptop. <laughs> this is not that laptop. I'm sorry, but <laughs> the other one was better. Uh, so yeah, uh, it's not too bad. The, the mobile phone situation, obviously you can just go to a local vendor and get a mobile phone. Uh, it's not too bad. Um, and I, d I don't travel with two laptops because I like to keep the weight uh, low. I like to travel with 20 kilos or less, ideally, because whilst you might have 30 kilos on international long-haul flights, domestic flights and short-haul uh, interna uh, international flights will only give you 23 kilos. So. Oh, one question over here. Um, just a question about uh, tools. Like in my um, 
my office I've got three monitors and, a, and sort of uh, quite a good setup and uh, I really enjoy that and uh, going to a cafe with uh, just a little MacBook uh, sort of air sort of pre presents some sort of challenges with it. Uh, I'd imagine that uh, travelling overseas as well there are some other challenges like uh, telephone calls, like sort of how do people get hold of you in terms of a phone number, right. um, those sort of things. So, so what are some of your uh, favourite tools when you're travelling that actually helps with your uh, work and workflow? Good question. First of all, in terms of the environment, I have a really nice 30-inch screen and uh, a very expensive ergonomic chair that I've missed enormously uh, while I was traveling. So it's been fantastic to kind of sit on that and work in that environment again now that I'm back. Um, in terms of things like phone calls and those sorts of things, there are some really good tools out there. An example of that may be having Skype with a Skype in number in the countries where your clients operate and having that advertised to your clients. That will then ring on Skype when your phone has data. Before you leave the country, forward your mobile number to that Skype number. Now you are accessible not only on those local call numbers with Skype in, but also your mobile phone will redirect to those and ring on Skype. Then while you're traveling, if you don't have data, you can set up Skype to go to a voicemail or to forward to an actual landline, which might be the number that changes every, every city that you go into or every country that you go into. Because I like to buy, I don't like those roaming SIM cards that, that you know, give you whole global thing. They're, they're bad. You just get a different SIM card in each country. Uh, focus on data rather than calls and leverage VoIP. Yeah, but it is, it is workable. And if you, for example, uh, you go to a country and you're only going to be there for a couple of days, you don't want to buy a SIM card and pay for, for data, go to a restaurant or go to cafes and as you walk around the streets, have the Wi-Fi networks open and running, you'll be able to guess which restaurants and cafes have, a, have Wi-Fi. Often they'll be password protected. Go have a meal, ask for the password, star it in Google Maps, and then every time you walk back to that place or in within range, you can just stand out the front of the restaurant, even if it's closed, get internet access, and make your calls. My Google Maps is littered with stars all over the world. Fanta I love Google Maps, probably the best tool you can have while you travel. Star your locations, absolutely. Um, and use that as the guide for when you walk a city. Mm. Any other questions? Um, I'll just add one extra thing. I know when I travelled around and I wanted to keep my, my uh, mobile number mm. active in Australia, I had to switch over to a 365-day a <coughs> plan because I was on prepaid. Right. So I didn't want to pay 40 bucks a month. So I did the same thing. I switched it over to like a year-long plan right. and then um, forward it to a Skype, right. a Skype number. I don't do that. I use a company called Amazim. They have no contracts and you can change your plan anytime you want. You can set your plan to a pay-as-you-go plan, which is $0 per month, and it has a much higher call cost. But you're going to be out of the country, you're not going to be using it. So I would do that while I traveled. It would be zero cost to me, uh, other than occasional forward calls, uh, which were very, very rare. Um, and that, that seriously reduced my mobile phone bill. And as soon as I come back to the country, change the plan to, to one with, with data and unlimited calls which I think is about 30 bucks a month. So that's a, that's a good option. They're on the Optus network.